much. I'm um, very happy to be here. We had the great three days uh, conference organized by the foundation. I met a number of people I had not known before. I'm very grateful for being able to make their acquaintance, especially colleagues from India. Um, today I want to um, talk about something that I have focused on in my research in the last three years or so, which has to do with the globalization of education. Um, let me uh, say briefly um, as background, I am originally from Germany, but I've lived now for 20 years in the United States. Um, I know many different education systems from my own um, experience as a teacher and student. I need my glasses. Um, and I've visited many, many um, schools in different countries um, for my research. And there's a trend that I'm uh, increasingly concerned about um, that um, I think is, is very problematic that has to do with the globalization of, of education. Um, in my visits to different countries in my research, one of my main impressions has always been um, that um, there's a vast variety of educational systems around the world. Um, and that there's a very close relationship between culture and education. When I moved to the United States from Germany, for example, I felt a, an immense sense of liberation coming from the German university to the American. In the German university, things were very hierarchical. In the American university, they were much more egalitarian and professors were a lot more um, easy to ac access and work with. Um, another key impression that I've had is that education is becoming increasingly central uh, for the overall well-being of our societies, and, and in particular um, democratic societies. One could almost say that education is rivaling in importance the economy and the political domain. The reason for that increased importance um, are two. In democratic societies, we place our trust in a unique and rare form of government, government, government which, uh, as Abraham Lincoln um, called it, is government of, by, and for the people. That means that every citizen must be capable of taking part in governing their own affairs and their own communities. In a complex society um, like those in most parts of the world today, uh, this requires a lot of knowledge um, as well as the ability to govern oneself. And to cultivate the moral and um, uh, virtuous excellences um, in that. This is a fairly ambitious agenda and we must pursue it in the midst of unheard of challenges arising from multicultural, multi-ethnic and multi-religious societies. Now it seems to me that we can no longer take for granted our ability to maintain our rich global cultural diversity in education as well as the dem democratic character of our schools and the education systems. This is a serious problem. Cultures are great storehouses of human intelligence uh, and human wisdom. Losing cultural diversity is every bit as serious a threat as losing biological diversity. The way human evolution works, I believe, is um, because we don't know what challenges await us tomorrow, we as a species keep a large number of alternative responses in store in the form of diverse cultures so that we can learn by observing which cultural forms are best adapted to the new conditions. In other words, we trust in diversity rather than our always very limited ability um, of planning or of rational foresight. If we allow the range of alternative cultural models to decrease, we may lose the very model that might have been especially helpful in pointing the way to the future. Something quite similar is true for individual countries and their social systems. 
If we fail in our ability to prepare the young for a future of self-government and, and do so while respecting the various cultural commitments of the many groups making up our modern societies, we create a vacuum of power that sooner or later will be seized by unaccountable elites which um, may succumb to the temptations of power. Currently, I believe, um, there's um, a world, education is transformed worldwide by three important changes. Globalization, efficiency, and privatization. All three of these are deeply ambivalent. They are forces that can be used for the good, but also for um, ill. They are ripe with potential for growth, but also with possibilities to halt and even reverse that growth. Globalization brings us the, the possibility of a global village. Um, it brings us a lot closer to each other. It means that we can, in the United States, enjoy Bollywood movies, which we do greatly. Um, but it also means a loss of, in, of a national sovereignty. It means that international organizations take over um, the functions that used to be um, conducted by national governments. Efficiency um, and the movement for accountability um, means that, greater, that there's a greater public concern for the quality of our public institutions, but it also has the risk of um, leading to greater standardization and greater uniformity in our institutions. Privatization means that there is more in the possibility of more institutional diversity and maybe more choice, but there's also the risk uh, that education becomes increasingly profit-oriented. Right now, I think the negative uh, possibilities seem to be worldwide on the rise. One reason for this may be that multinational corporations and organizations have taken the lead in working out how to model and implement these changes. This is in many ways not surprising. Multinational corporations have a much easier time operating on a global scale than individuals or local communities or even national governments. They are just much better organized. So in a way, um, these organizations, and I will talk about some of them in more detail later, they responded first to the new conditions and they may to a certain extent be excused for blundering and leading us down a path that may turn out to be unsustainable. After all, the individuals leading these organizations are fallible humans. But when a few fallible humans gain the power to shape the way we think and what we value on a worldwide scale, we need to be on alert. Not only because, as the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, um, but also because the universal law that American founders well knew well um, is that those entrusted with power have in time and by slow operations perverted it into tyranny. In fact, it is precisely in order to check and balance that perennial aspect of human nature that Thomas Jefferson, who wrote these lines that I just quoted, called on his fellow Americans to institute universal education at public expense. Jefferson believed that public schools were a, a, a crucial antidote to the always present danger of uh, despotism, even in a democracy. Jefferson also warned us that we should, um, in questions of power, place our confidence not in the good intentions or the expertise of, of a few individual men or women, but in institutions uh, that might bind him down from mischief by the chains of political design. I think this is not what's happening today. I think, on the contrary, we, we are uh, placing our trust and our confidence in a few individuals that so far are not accountable. Um, we have entrusted the um, kind, what kind of education we need and um, what kind of um, 
schooling we want um, to, to be defined by a few individuals in global organizations um, that, has, that may have um, wide-reaching consequences. There are many specific changes that have brought us to this point, but one of the most important one is a global assessment of public schools, a global measurement developed by the OECD, the Organization for Economic Development and Cooperation, called PISA, the Program for International Student Assessment. Um, this may strike you as a rather extrav extravagant claim. How could an assessment of educational quality lead to endanger uh, cultural diversity and, and freedom? So let me back up a little bit and explain um, what I mean. I think it is obvious that we are becoming a global community, but we do not have a central global government to govern our affairs. And while historically some have thought that, a, that um, a global central government might be desirable, for example, Albert Einstein wrote about that possibility um, in his day, most people today think of that as an Orwellian nightmare to be avoided. And yet there are clearly issues that we have to take care of as a global community. Climate change and environmental pollution uh, no, no borders and financial and security issues also require concerted efforts. So instead of a central government, uh, what has developed is a variety of global organizations um, that facilitate the cooperation of people and of governments across borders. I think principally there are two kinds of those organizations. The United Nations and its many affiliated organizations like UNESCO and UNICEF, the International Labour Organizations, uh, organization in Geneva and others. Uh, these organizations go back to the end of World War II um, when the international community responded to the horrors of that time with the will to replace the system of violent nationalisms with a system of international cooperation based on the idea of universal human rights. The other kind of global, and, and this um, form of global governance that's basically um, pivot, pivoting around the United Nations, um, there's a form of democratic accountability. Nations have seats on different councils in that organization. They can vote, they can say yes and no. Uh, the other kind of global organizations that have assumed functions of global governance is a network of organizations revolving not around the advancement of human rights, but around the promotion of the growth of global economic markets. The main actors here are the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, and the OECD. Most people, if they have heard of the OECD at all, know it as a provider of information and statistics um, concerning economic and financial indices that governments use to compare their situation to that of others and perhaps adapt their policies. And the always, um, but in the last two decades, the OECD has changed. It has become much more, it has, become much more of an advocacy-oriented organization. It has taken strong positions on um, what it sees as desirable forms of economic and public policy and has become increasingly invested to turn those views um, into policy of the member nations, of which there are 34 at, at present. Just maybe a quick aside, the, um, many people are not familiar with the OECD and how it works. Um, it was founded, um, it grew out of the Marshall Plan uh, that the United States um, um, implemented after World War II to help the recovery, economic recovery in Western Europe. And um, its principal actors um, are the United States and the United Kingdom as the two main um, and Canada as the two or three main um, World War II victors, um, which were, however, generous enough in, in the day to provide a lot of assistance to the recovery of, um, say, Germany, where um, I probably indirectly benefited. Um, 
So um, it is an organization that is concerned with economic cooperation, but it is not accessible to democratic accountability. Um, it is governed by a, an assembly of finance and economics ministers, um, but it um, is funded um, by uh, money uh, that is given by the member countries in proportion to their uh, GNP, which means that the United States and the United Kingdom give the most money and have, as a result, also the most say in the organization. During the 1990s, the OECD has, um, for example, pushed very strongly for governments to shed um, many of their functions and services and let them be managed by private for-profit companies, the market. The watchword here was a new public management. The idea was that governments had become costly, inefficient and bloated bureaucracies, which they have often indeed, and that using market mechanisms and market actors would help alleviate the problem and the burden on the taxpayer. What the OECD experts did not talk about, and perhaps not even think about, in a democracy we are not only concerned with cost efficiency, but also with values and norms like human dignity. And it turned out that private for-profit companies could indeed run prisons or garbage disposal companies um, more cost effective, but with reduced costs also came, and with reduced public oversight, also came reduced attention to human dignity. Abuse and violence in prisons that were privately managed went up, and the working conditions of garbage workers, just for one example, went down. Then in the late 1990s, the OECD decided to direct its attention to public schools on a global scale. From a new, and they had always, you know, uh, collected statistics and provided data, but um, in the 1990s, uh, things changed. From a new public management point of view, public schools represent an industry uh, ripe for change. After the health sector, education makes up the second largest expenditure in many, mo in many modern nations. Expenditures for which um, new public managers sees no economic, see no economic benefits. The vast sums of money going into paying teachers, school buildings, and everything from textbooks to tests and um, a range of um, you know, other services were spent seemingly unproductively. From this point of view, these monies were in many ways wasted. In most countries, only a few and fairly small private for-profit companies were benefiting from the expenditures going into public schools. All this is now changing, and much of it is due to the phenomenal success of PISA, the program for international student assessment. And just a quick aside here on the, the acronym um, PISA, which again stands for Program of International Student Assessment, but it also is a town in northern Italy um, which is famous for its leaning tower. Um, and I'm wondering whether the OECD was trying to give us a subtle message that you can actually have a thing, uh, a construction that is placed on faulty foundations remain stable over time. So what does PISA do? PISA purports to measure how well the 15-year-old um, youngsters of 34 member nations, plus in the meantime 30 other nations, are prepared for the demands of, a, of the new global economy. It is unique among educational assessments, of which there have been many others before PISA, um, such as the uh, trends, TIMS, Trends in International Math and Science, it is unique among educational assessments in that it ignores the curricular and cultural goals of the many participant nations, which naturally differ very dramatically. It does not provide information to member nations on how well they achieve their self-defined goals. Rather, 
It measures how well uh, these nations prepare for something that the OECD experts claim to be able to tell, uh, namely the demands of the future global economy. Now, there are a few things uh, remarkable here. First, if the OECD was so concerned about how well schools in Japan, Germany, or Argentina prepared their youth for the economy, why not ask the companies in those countries? Or why not look at employment and economic data? A key statistic they could consult might be the number of jobs companies cannot fill because they cannot find the properly prepared employees. That would tell you something about how well schools are preparing people for the economy. And that is a you know, readily available statistic. And consulting it would have answered um, that question of the OECD and saved the member nations millions of dollars that are spent on PISA. Secondly, um, what crystal ball do the economists and statisticians, <coughs> statisticians at OECD possess that allows them to forecast the demands of the global economy? And whence their confidence in their ability to look so reliably into the future? Everyone knows how dramatically the global economy has changed even in just the past 10 years. As the internet has changed not only how we do business but also the sectors in which economic growth is most dramatic. A little more than a decade ago, people were using phone and fax to communicate long distance. Nobody in that day could have predicted the dramatic changes that new technologies have brought since. So my first objection to PISA is that it purports to measure something that requires a crystal ball that no human has ever proven to possess. And it shuns the data that are readily available to answer the more modest question what discrepancies might exist between the needs of the employment sector and the results of the public schools. The second objection has to do with how PISA measures what it purports to measure. Hundreds, um, even thousands of education experts around the world have poured over the PISA tests and have um, raised serious objections to the methods used by the test designers. They have unearthed serious problems with writing test questions that would be understood equally well in a dramatic variety of cultures. Just for one example, they found that a question that involved a racetrack where the kids had to calculate the distance um, that the race cars um, uh, went, that that question um, was answered reasonably well by British boys, as expected, but not by girls in Greece. I don't know, they may have never seen a racetrack. Or, uh, um, or they found that test items did not do well in translation. It would, for example, take many more words to translate uh, the short and clipped English questions into Spanish, which meant that the Spanish test takers had to read a lot more words before being able to answer the question. A third group of objections, <clears throat> the intransparency of statistical methods and formulas used to score the tests um, and the weight given to different component parts of a test. It turned out, as people looked into this, that slight changes in the formula or in the weights given to different parts of the test could mean the difference between a country going up a few points or going down a few points from one um, iteration uh, to the next. And I didn't mention yet, um, PISA is administered every three years. Um, the last, and it has been done for by, um, by now four times. Uh, the last results were published in uh, December of last year. So it, it is not, and governments, you know, pay very careful attention uh, whether they go up five points or, or go down five points, and people lose jobs over that. Most recently, um, I think one of the education responsible officials in Wales, in the UK, uh, came under fire because Wales, which was um, which was um, tested separately by the OECD, um, somehow had gone down. Um, 
So it is not at all clear whether a nation's uh, up or down on the PISA test um, should be attributed to any real changes in the way their schools work or just to some uh, you know, statistical artifact. In a similar vein, PISA, PISA authors had um, distinct ideas about the ways to teach mathematics so that uh, those nations that adopted a PISA-style math curriculum fared significantly better than others on the PISA test, although math education experts are far from united about the merits of the uh, respective math curriculum. But all these objections, serious as they are, pale in my mind in comparison with objections regarding the political and ideological consequences of PISA. PISA uh, has contributed to an escalation in uh, testing, um, and this by testing I always mean standardized testing. Um, that's the same you know, for, for all kinds of different um, kids in all kinds of different um, nations and cultures. And, um, and usually multiple choice, and dramatically increase the reliance on quantitative measures um, as well as an increase in reliance on scripted, vendor-made, which vendor is a word for private company, made lessons, and less autonomy for our teachers. PISA has caused a shift of attention to short-term fixes by which a government hopes that in three years, it may actually climb up a few points in the uh, rankings. Um, and for those of you who are not too familiar with PISA, um, one thing to know that is that uh, Finland um, used to be the top ranking country uh, for three times, for 10 years in a row. Um, followed by um, many of the small nation sta uh, city states uh, like Shanghai, um, uh, I mean like uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, and uh, lately also Shanghai, which the OECD accepted as China's entry into the PISA Olympics, even though normally they're only f whole countries that are um, studied. So, um, on the last iteration, uh, Finland unexplainably uh, dropped 20 points, which is quite a drop, and um, the leading countries now are Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, um, and uh, Shanghai. Um, so PISA has caused a shift in, in of attention to short-term fixes that you know would help Germany to get closer to Korea or such. Um, one of the big dangers of a test like, test like PISA is because it obviously measures only very narrow um, aspects of education, uh, people always adapt their behavior, and here I mean teachers and um, cult, um, education officials, adapt their behavior to, to the things that those in power pay attention to. In other words, what is measured by a test like PISA gets attention and what is not measured is left behind. PISA has taken attention away from the less measurable and or immeasurable educational objectives like physical, moral, civic or artistic development. To carry out PISA, the, the test, um, and many follow-up um, tests and follow-up services, the OECD has, in accord with its ideology of um, new public management, embraced public-private partnerships, which means in, fa in practice it has brought in private companies um, to assist in the, in the um, carrying out the tests as well as offering participant countries help if they needed it um, um, in exchange for good money uh, to improve their education systems. Um, some of these companies uh, have benefited greatly from um, PISA and their cooperation with the OECD. One of the chief ones is Pearson, uh, a big uh, multinational company that now calls itself the Global Learning Company. Uh, one example of what Pearson is doing is um, it not only is preparing the test for the next iteration in 2016, it just got the contract for that from the OECD. 
Um, it also is preparing the introduction of for-profit primary education in Africa. Um, and coincidentally, the OECD is at present in the process of um, expanding PISA into Africa. And one may well imagine that um, you know, any deficiencies that PISA will unearth in Nigeria, Kenya, or Botswana will then be followed by Pearson's offering to help um, alleviating those deficiencies. So OECD and companies like Pearson work together on bringing PISA to um, countries in the third world that have no uh, reasonable expectation to gain anything from being compared to um, Shanghai or um, Singapore. Um, last not least, PISA is making life for our children uh, increasingly hard um, because it has led, certainly in, the, in countries like the United States, to a um, multiplication of uh, standardized testing which now is you know, hitting the schools every two, three months uh, when <clears throat> school children um, are asked to sit for 90 minutes three days in a row and answer multiple choice questions. And I will read you in a minute a couple of poems from, from children um, about their experience. Um, so let me um, offer you a, uh, an image that captures, the, in my mind, the grave dangers associated with the form of educational globalization that is currently dominant. Um, some of you may be familiar with the philosopher uh, Jeremy Bentham, who um, 200 years ago um, you know, became known as the father of um, a philosophy called utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is the belief that people will and should always act so as to maximize their pleasures or their utility. In Bentham's world, there are no hard choices to make. People don't forego money for reasons of honor, virtue, or human dignity. They don't forego pleasure or make sacrifices for their friends, family, or for their country. They just always maximize pleasure and utility. They are, in other words, um, not very recognizably human. Bentham, by the way, uh, we know of um, new biographic, historical biographical work on him, was quite a weird fellow. His best friend throughout life was always his dog. He didn't uh, get along with people very well. Um, but by treating humans um, as if they were narrow utility maximizers, Bentham thought that he could dramatically increase efficiency and control in society. So one of the inventions he came up with is the famous panopticon, designed to make the task of prison guards simpler and more efficient. The panopticon is a prison where the cells holding the prisoners are arranged in a circle around a central observation post allowing a single guard to observe the state of the prisoners in their cells simply by turning on his heels and turning his gaze from cell to cell. In this fashion, the single guard in the prison tower would notice where a prison door was open, where a prisoner was misbehaving or not coming out of the cell at the appointed hour. Any irregularity was captured by a single glance by uniformly aligning prison cells for easy readability or observability. I think governments have always um, worshipped um, a certain kind of uniformity in their subjects, um, to use one of um, Alexis de Tocqueville's phrases about uh, government. Alexis de Tocqueville is the author of Democracy in America, a pioneering book written 200 years ago. Um, on the possibilities and um, conditions under which uh, democracy could be a liberal uh, democracy as opposed to a, um, what he called tyranny of the majority. Um, so uniformity improves the governmentality of um, the subjects of a government 
because when they're aware of being observed, they try to avoid trouble and will adapt their behavior to the expected norm. Tocqueville uh, believed that education was a great tool for governments to create that kind of desirable uniformity in their subjects. And um, I think education today is in danger of being turned into a panopticon. The guard at the center is not a man in, in uh, military boots equipped with lethal weapons. It is rather a mild-mannered statistician equipped with a yardstick, the PISA test, that governments around the world have invested with unprecedented power simply by accepting that it measures objectively the quality of the education system and that they had to compete for higher rank on the PISA scale. Education allows a central government to take, as Tocqueville said, each member of the community in its powerful grasp and fashion him at will. Society becomes a network of small, complicated rules, minute and uniform. <clears throat> the will of men is not shattered, but softened, bent, and guided. Men are seldom forced by it to act, but they are constantly restrained from acting. I think these are possible prospects that we face um, in education if we allow the current uh, form of globalization in education to take um, hold. But I think there are alternatives. Um, there are corporations that are across nations in education that are not driven and governed uh, and uh, governed by organizations like the OECD or the World Bank, but by the people themselves. Um, the internet offers the opportunity to uh, form connections um, between students, between researchers, between um, parents and citizens, and discuss um, what kind of education they want um, and whether the current changes are in their interest. Um, so they also, you know, allow me to come here um, and um, speak about my views of these issues. Um, I want to finish by pointing to the photo on the screen, if it's still up there, is it? Um, that's not me, by the way, the guy sitting there behind the gravestone, um, but um, it's, it's part of a campaign in the United States um, against um, increased testing and increased narrowing and of the curriculum and increased privatization of uh, schooling. And in case you can't read it, there are a couple of you know mock gravestones where it says, rest in peace, creativity, rest in peace, joy, uh, in memory of cooperation killed by high stakes testing, uh, here lies the future of public education in remembrance of caring and so forth. Um, educators in the United States at least are coming up with creative ways to pay, um, to direct attention to these developments. And a friend of mine um, who um, is a principal in a school in New York State, uh, one of her teachers actually asked uh, their students, her students, after one of those high stakes tests to write poems about their experience in the test period, which you probably know, you know, it's 90 minutes or two hour or, or um, three hours sometimes, where students sit with a multiple choice bubble sheet with a pencil that, where they just have to, you know, um, decide which of four possible answers is the right one. So I'll read you one or two of these poems. Um, these are, by the way, eighth graders, so they would be 12 years old, 13 years old. Beautiful weather outside the murky window, fresh, crisp breeze sneaking in through a crack in the broken glass, someone crying in the distance, teachers' penetrating eyes scrutinizing our every move, staring into the depths of our souls, Traces of, sta of stale Cheerios eaten for breakfast, Cheerios, the breakfast cereal, lingering in your mouth, the burning, um, uh, 
the burning ache of your poor, overworked hand. God forsaken ELA. ELA is the English language arts test. And just one other. Boring, nonsensical, stupid stories, fresh paper and packaging, pencils, scratching on the paper, bored, tired, and amazed at how ridiculous the stories are, minty gums that I am chewing, we really need to reform. Thank you. Thanks to Professor Heinz for the talk. Now is the time for discussion. Uh, Prakash, uh, I hear from Azim Prem University, is going to moderate the discussion. I'll just help uh, people take turns asking questions so that the mic is passed to the right person. That's as much as I'm going to I would like your comments on what I'm going to say now. It has been suggested by some people and uh, there is a certain view that Western universalism is now, especially in the social sciences, patronizingly taking over the entire education scenario. Uh, this is not too bad in uh, many geographies, but for, especially for India, uh, there is a view that uh, Western universalism tends to take, uh, extract a lot of good things from all around the world, which is not a bad thing, without giving due credit, which is a bad thing. And thereafter, without giving due credit, credit to, to, to the origin to the origin of the knowledge you have extracted. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, all right so long as there is parity from between this Western universalism practitioners and the others, which obviously isn't there. Because Western universalism, especially America and the social sciences, the academia are all have their own frameworks, concepts, paradigms, parameters, views, worldviews, funding, honor system, reward system, and once you fall, follow that, they'll watch you for about three to four times, you're permanently out. And in the guise of pretentious liberal attitude, which is absolutely fake. There's a perspective, a view. I'd like your comments on this. In the guise of being very liberal, they gatekeep and ensure that anything that they don't want to come out, this applies to the academia and the media, which is generally in consensus. Every, it's a nice cozy relationship between everyone. Uh, they ensure that they gatekeep and they don't allow diverse opinion to come out. The, and finally, with the help of the media, establish a one-sided Western universalism worldview. Your comments, please. Well, I, I agree 100%. <laughs> um, no, I think that's a very, that's a very astute um, analysis of the, of the uh, situation uh, that I share uh, completely, but I don't think you would find many Western journalists, for example, share what you just said. Um, because they do not see the world as a pluralism of cultures, um, but rather uh, take for granted the uh, fact that Western culture, um, especially American, European um, culture, is uh, somehow the most advanced because it has produced uh, um, until now or in the last 200 years the most um, the fastest economic development, which is their main standard for uh, quality. And uh, they don't often even understand uh, the origin and the sources and the quality of other cultures. And I can, you know, t take my own, uh, myself as an example. It took uh, me quite a few decades to start reading um, and, and 
trying to deeply understand uh, Eastern cultures. Um, I now am, you know, study um, those uh, cultures um, quite um, intensively, and I am, um, you know, once I started doing it, I've been, you know, blown away, more or less, by um, how different uh, the main assumptions about, um, um, you know, cultural values, human life, uh, um, and um, what is, uh, you know, a desirable form of, of um, uh, human dignity are between, uh, say, you know, Western individualism and, you know, shaped by Western Protestantism and um, traditions like Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Confucianism. So um, the fact that an organization like the OECD can take one test and think that it can measure and capture adequately um, the, you know, quality of education in these vastly different cultural um, universes, I think speaks in, uh, for itself and speaks to what you just said. Um, the other fact that journalists are largely, um, you know, um, extremely eager to uh, get their um, hands on these ranking lists and then, um, you know, uh, comment them without questioning the basic assumptions on which these tests are uh, resting, which like the Tower of Pisa, you know, um, are somewhat um, misshaped. Um, that is, you know, uh, probably the main uh, expression right now for um, the, or let's say the um, uh, insularity of Western, many Western uh, um, media and, and Western intellectuals. There are some very famous, um, you know, New York Times commentators um, who, when PISA tests come out, say, well, of course it shows, you know, the United States is always a little above average, but quite away, away from Shanghai and Singapore. Big, big surprise. Um, they say, well, you know, we fall behind. We need to uh, continue reshaping our education system without ever asking <laughs> what does this test really measure? And uh, without even looking or, or observing that if you take, in the case of the United States, if you take the top performing, say, eight countries out, which are all small city states, or, st or countries like Liechtenstein, uh, which has um, as many uh, sc uh, school children um, as would fit in one single American big high school. Uh, and it is the richest country in the world, or one of the richest countries. So those countries make up the top. Um, if you take that top away, then the United States is only within 20 points. This is, you know, by the way, a scale that goes from that, I mean, the top uh, scoring countries are around 600, and the United States, I think, was at uh, around 500 or something. But so if you take these top countries away, the uh, United States is only a, a tw 20 points away from, say, Canada, which does quite well, and, or Australia. And 20 points was the difference between Finland in the, in the second to last to the last iteration, and they hadn't changed anything in their education system. So these are very easily observable facts. You don't need to be a statistician to figure this out. But this is not something they observe or, 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 or comment upon. So. I commend you for um, your penetrating analysis there. Uh, <clears throat> Professor, you know, which uh, cultural practices of assessments uh, that you think are worthy of appreciation? Uh, I didn't quite get that. You know, the different practices, you know, the different practices that are followed by different cultures you know, assessment practices, which you think are worthy of appreciation and which you can look into. Which can are better? You can share some examples. Well, first of all, I, I think, um, well, let me make a couple of distinctions. Um, uh, one important distinction that people um, are often not aware of, there are two kinds of tests or two kinds of assessments. One is formative and the other is summative. At least that's the terminology that people use. 
formative assessments are when you take the test, you actually learn something. Summative assessments are purely for the benefit of bureaucrats. Um, so PISA and you know the majority of the standardized tests that um, our kids in the U.S. are given now every, it seems like every other month, um, they, are summat they are summative tests. In other words, the students, as you saw from these poems, they, they certainly don't benefit. You know, they don't learn anything. They don't grow through these tests. They are basically, um, you know, uh, tested like, you know, chicken might be tested uh, through, be through um, you know, uh, some kind of medical uh, procedure about, about their bacteria or whatever. Um, so that's one distinction. So I would say a, a quality assessment would have to have a strong formative component. Um, the second distinction is what do you compare? Um, I think it's, it's fairly safe to compare, um, say, you know, school A uh, in 2014 to school A in 2012 assuming nothing much has changed in the you know, student population composition and so forth. And that might actually be a useful data point to have for the school leaders uh, and so forth. Um, it is much more problematic and, and requires a lot more work um, to make that kind of comparison useful for comparisons across different schools. Already for across one school from one city to another, and certainly for, for comparisons across countries and cultures. Um, because so many um, things that we, so much of what we do in education is culturally shaped and culturally defined. Um, you know, and assumptions that uh, an American school child might, might take for granted will not be shared by, by the 15 year old uh, um, high schooler in India or in, in, in uh, Botswana. So, um, to get comparisons across those large cultural divides, I think we need, we would have to use much more subtle forms of assessment that would have to include um, strong um, qualitative components, not just quantitative uh, uh, components. It would also, in my mind, uh, uh, have to include uh, visits of real educators from one country to another. Why, why don't we you know, use some of the money that the OECD uh, pours into PISA and allow some American teachers to go to Shanghai and, or Korea and see how education works there and whether they would find that kind of education desirable for American uh, uh, you know, school children. Uh, and vice versa, you know, let's take some of these Shanghai teachers and let them visit um, uh, the US or India or whatever. So there should be real people involved, not just a test that is, you know, easily marked in. You know, these tests, by the way, are based on a sample of 5,000 kids in each of these countries that they take two hours to complete. That's it. And yet we base an enormous amount of consequences on these kinds of tests which, by the way, violates one of the many, you know, precepts in, of good uh, educational assessments, which is not ever to base high stakes consequences on the single test. If you want to, you know, find out data and, and, and a basis for reform, you need to do a bunch of tests. And, uh, and, uh, and there should be different ones and should, they should measure different things. Did I answer your question at all? Well, I mean, there, there are, you know, as I said, there is the, uh, one of the main um, global tests outside of PISA is a test called Third International Math. Oh, I mean, it used to be called Third International Math and Science Test, um, but now it's the T stands for Trends in International Math and Science, uh, which is called uh, TIMS for short. And um, uh, TIMS actually, um, focuses on the, act, on the actual curriculum, on what a nation tries to teach to its kids, and then um, orients the testing or the assessment to um, incorporate those goals, those, those uh, uh, curricula, um, as opposed to the 
PISA test, which ignores all that and, and simply says, we know what the economy needs, so we base our test on what the economy needs. Um, so that's one big difference in, in TIMS. Another big difference is TIMS is actually governed, created, and conducted by academics, independent academics that have formed this uh, consortium um, that administers the test. Um, and as academics, they are obliged to certain rules of the game, like um, you know, full data transparency uh, and so forth, that the OECD, as a more or less private club, is not obliged to. So that's a big difference. Um, so if I had to choose between the two, I would certainly you know, uh, prefer uh, Tim's any day. Um, I still think that um, we need additional tests that are sensitive to the cultural um, variation across countries, and that also um, affirm that cultural variation in, instead of saying uh, in, implicitly, you know, we, we take this Western-based standard and measure everything, uh, or, you know, uh, a Western com combination of Western and, and uh, um, you know, fast developing uh, East Asian uh, city-states uh, and measure everything else on this, by this standard. <clears throat> the Americans claim to be the greatest democracy on earth. And America manufactures the maximum... Which is the greatest democracy? America yeah. claims okay. to be the greatest democracy on earth. Right. And America manufactures the maximum of weapons of destruction. And today the American society therefore has come to one against 99. That's the American society today. India claims to be the largest democracy with Jagat Gurus. You know the word Jagat Gurus and all that. And we buy the maximum weapons of mass destruction from America and the rest of the world. So with these two democracies, what's wrong with our education system basically? This is my question to you. A second question. What do you think about the Cuban education system? The which? The Cuban? Education system. <laughs> I have no idea what... Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know much about the Cuban system at all, uh, so um, I, I just know that it's not a particularly democratic country. Um, but anyway, um, you were asking about the... Uh, um, I, I did not fully understand the comparison between India and uh, democracy. And, I mean, obviously your point about 1 to 99, you know, um, is, is ex extremely important. Um, if I can just comment on that aspect. We um, have very good data and I have done some of that uh, research myself, that shows that um, if we take data like PISA, a huge amount of the variation on the PISA data is actually predicted by the social inequality in these countries. Um, that's at least, you know, a very important uh, predictor. And, um, of course, you know, in the United States, uh, inequality has increased dramatically. Um, when I when I first came there in the 1980s, I think it was a middle-class society. Today, um, it is much more like an oligarchy um, where, um, you know, 1% of the population uh, has the wealth of the remaining 99% and increasingly a political influence to match that. Um, you know, there are, there are foundations now in the United States that are privately funded, like the Bill Gates Foundation, um, uh, many others, and they are um, some of the main actors in the privatization of education. They are, uh, you know, funding private schools, charter schools. Um, they are um, becoming advocates of this kind of these kinds of reforms. And of course, these foundations are accountable to no one. Um, they, you know, they just do what they please. Um, I didn't get the po your point about India. Um, Weapons, yeah. What, in India? Yeah. 
What's the point? Oh, okay. And and not even an exception with what you <laughs> Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I think that's just a, you know an interesting comment on the situation. I I, I can't <laughs> take it any any further. Hello. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about the education, uh, is it not that the education really starts from the womb of the mother, as a child is concerned, or much earlier because of the genes that comes from the parents? And then what happens to the child uh, is that, you know, when it goes to the, the first education, that is to kindergarten or Montessori, you know, I, I believe that in America and in the Western countries, they have a best system where the pre-primary uh, is not attached to the primary schools. That means the, the smaller children, till five years, they don't travel more than five kilometers as per the United Nations resolution. I don't know if there's a resolution about In the it. United States, you mean? Yeah. Uh, but in India, what I see is that uh, the children who is just two and a half years or three years going to Montessori 1 about the Montessori system, I really made this point that the Montessori system, at least, you know, first one, two, three, should be community-based, not attached to the schools. And the answer I got was that, uh, you know, anyway they are going to bigger school, the earlier the better. But we are not considering about the age of the child where the child is really dragged into the bus and the, they are handled by the people who are not really professionally knowing how to handle the emotional uh, needs of the child or the psychological needs of the child. And the, what happens is that at the later stage, the child becomes like more, uh, you know, just senseless about love and affection and all that. Um, this is a really paining for, for me because I've noticed it in, in, in my... Uh, environment around. Yeah. What is your reflection about that? Because we are looking towards the US or, you know, like, you know, somebody commented about the Western globalization, whatever. And then this is actually happening in India, where the government is really allowing the schools, the primary schools or high schools to have pre-primary into there. And it is maybe due to corruption or, you know, the people are uh, high-handedly using it for their business purposes. What is the reflection on that? Well, I mean, it is, it is certainly true that, um, um, that worldwide we have a trend um, of education becoming a subject of um, social ambition um, in, of the parents. Um, and that hap has happened for quite a while in, in the United States. It, it is now uh, happening in in, in Europe, it is certainly happening in countries like Korea, um, where parents send their kids, you know, for six hours or uh, I mean, until eight, nine, ten in the evening to go to cram schools after school, um, and they pay for it privately because they want their kids to have, uh, you know, high scores at the end of the high school so that they can get to university. And this may also be happening in India. I'm not familiar enough, uh, but it seems like from what you say. So, uh, yes, we have a worldwide um, uh, trend, I think, where, um, you know, people are, you, are looking at education not as a, um, as a, a resource to in, for growth and enrichment, but as a tool for economic upward mobility. Um, and I think that you know, is, is a very uh, dangerous thing because um, instead of education being a common experience that, that uh, creates, you know, social ties among uh, um, and creates what we call social capital among um, kill, uh, children and, and parents, it becomes, you know, what in America is called cutthroat competition, you know, um, where we try to outdo each other and use our elbows and... Um, and one aspect of that is that um, the schools become increasingly dissociated from the local community or the neighborhood. Um, so as you say, you know, um, parents um, accept uh, in, and, uh, and make their kids accept uh, longer and longer travel distances to go to a school that they think is a little better than the school that they have in their neighborhood. Um, with the consequence that it, you know, becomes more difficult for the kids to form um, uh, social ties. Um, 
Um, I fully agree. I mean, it's it's a very um, it's a very and of course also the the other trend that you remarked on, which is that we start formal schooling ever earlier. Um, you know, at age uh, three or even even before that, uh, when kids really should not should not spend most of their day in a in a institution. They should you know spend it playing around in um, friends and family. Um, I, I, I agree with that too. I think kindergarten should not be an academic environment. It should be, a, uh, you know, and I mean the kindergarten was created by, or was invented by, you know, uh, uh, a German educator named Froebel and, and he was basing his ideas on the ideas of Rousseau um, and Rousseau was a very much against early education, formal education. He said, you know, we need to create space for these uh, youngsters to grow spontaneously according to their to their uh, uh, women their instincts in play rather than force them into um, early academic learning so it should be detached and should be a whole different thing I'm sorry we only have five minutes more and there are maybe we could collect both questions from the two people and if you could make your question sharp and brief then of course no, uh, they've been raising their hand for quite yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah, I have some comments. I don't know how short and brief I can make it. Yeah, so I think I uh, appreciate several uh, points, you know, about the globalization of education versus, you know, and that has issues. Uh, so one uh, question I have is that, uh, is it fair to judge a PISA or a TIMS or any assessment uh, uh, on this aspect, I mean, we, we could argue about whether education should be globalized or local and, you know, to the extent to which it could be. Uh, but uh, if a country or, you know, a society as a whole is subscribed to a global model of education in certain things, uh, can we dismiss a PISA or a TIMS because they're measuring something? I mean, we may, uh, and a lot of your arguments I see uh, are related to interpretation of the metric. So PISA, for example, does not claim that they measure everything. Um, so, because I have seen, so I will just give two or three examples of, you know, uh, I, I work for an assessment company, so I'm obviously a little biased towards uh, assessments. Uh, for example, PISA, uh, like no other, uh, you know, uh, thing, instrument, has drawn attention to Finland. So, when, so we have started looking at Finland and we realized that children till the age of seven in Finland do not necessarily have to go to school, a point uh, the person made here. Without PISA, we may never have looked at it. Tim's has a series of very wonderful videos on classrooms and you yourself said, you know, the academic angle was there. So can we throw away this international benchmarking, you know, the benefits it provides us? I have many other issues, of course. For example, PISA is not all, all multiple choice. There are free responses. And even the translations are undertaken by a national group which is constituted within the country. Member countries choose to use it. They should hopefully have sensible people who can interpret these things properly. So I'm wondering whether, you know, we can throw out the index and the metric just because users are not able to interpret it properly. Thank you. Sure, sure. I appreciated your uh, talk, Professor. But I'm wondering if the issue of ignoring context and culture is just unidimensional or there are several layers to it. Uh, so let me give an example. The way the items are selected itself is based on a theory that negates the fact of culture. Okay. Um, let me start with the first question I'm, I'm, and maybe ask you again. Um, um, so should we dismiss PISA um, because it is, you know, maybe falsely used or overused by um, by politicians and, and, and governments um, and doesn't have doesn't it have a certain value for example by pointing to education practices in a country like Finland um, I think there my my response would be there are layers or levels of criticism that one can distinguish um, I don't think one has to take the view that PISA is utterly wrong and 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 or useless uh, i don't i don't necessarily you know would take that view even though i think the, the test itself could be 
a way a better. Um, it could include and should include qualitative elements. It should include elements uh, for, that the countries themselves define uh, for their own purposes. Um, but what, is, what would be crucial is that there's more than one PISA, or, or actually a PISA and something, you know, a few other things. I mean, an example is um, we now have about a half a dozen um, assessments of higher education around the world. So, you know, a country can actually say, well, we're not so very good on the Shanghai index, but we are, you know, quite good on the um, one that put, is put out by the um, Times um, of London. Um, and these tests are constructed differently, they measure different things, um, and you can basically, it, it creates a, a more of a plural, plural, plurality of um, assessments where a country can say, yeah, I mean, it reflects that we are emphasizing this as opposed to that. So I think much would already be gained if there was not one assessment that everyone is, you know, using, but several. Um, and um, I, I think governments should actually have an interest in sponsoring the creation of alternatives to PISA. Um, a, uh, a, a second question I think that is related, um, PISA would also be much less dangerous if it was more sensibly reported. Um, the main thing that gets attention from the media is are the ranking lists. Uh, which are like the Olympics. Um, Finland has 30 gold medals and, you know, then goes down. Um, which is an ex extremely simplistic and, uh, um, uh, I mean, virtually uh, or bordering on useless. Um, what, what would be much more useful is if you created groups of countries by certain similar similarities of factors, such as socioeconomics, per capita income, cultural, ethnic uh, um, heterogeneity. And then you could compare within those clusters, you know, and then you could say, yeah, why, why is Canada doing, you know, better than the United States, even though many of these characteristics are similar, which would cre create a very different discussion around the world. We would not be, you know, how can we get from the United States up to Shanghai, but rather how can we, you know, bridge that much smaller gap from U.S. to Canada, for example. So. Again, I'm not saying, you know, forget about PISA, but make it, use it more sensibly, uh, make amendments and, and create alternatives to it. I think other organizations like the United Nations, the UNESCO, which has often done assessments uh, that have not become very, very widely known, should get into the act and should con conduct uh, um, assessments that emphasize different things. UNESCO is much more interested in culture, for example, and in cultural um, diversity. They could, you know, develop their own test that could rival in interest and, and impact uh, PISA. Now, I forgot the, first, the second question. Could you maybe re restate it? I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, sorry, but we had to be on for a while. So we have to close we'll talk about it. Okay. Could you just disperse and uh, provide the link uh, to the talk? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. India did not participate in PISA last year, and I would recommend they stay out of it. 